How real is the war between India and China? India and China have a lot in common. They are the two largest countries by area in Asia, the most populous countries in the world. They have 3 billion citizens between them. They belong to dynamically developing economies, claim to be new geopolitical superpowers, and belong to the BRICS organization. However, despite all this, India and China are two irreconcilable rivals that oppose each other in many ways. If the confrontation between the USSR and the USA was called the Cold War, observers call the conflict between the two Asian giants a hot peace. The states not only exchange diplomatic notes or wage trade wars, there are also clashes with fatal consequences. A second Indo-Chinese war could break out soon, which, given the nuclear weapons in both states, could have far-reaching consequences not only for Asia, but for the whole world. So what is spoiling relations between India and China? How are they opposing each other? How are other states involved in this? What does Tibet and water have to do with it? And how likely is the prospect of a major armed conflict in East Asia? Let's discuss it all in this video. Before the most interesting part, please subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. In March, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence presented the Annual Threat Assessment Report. It states that India and China are actively developing infrastructure and building up forces in their border regions. This could lead to further escalation and the start of a major armed clash this year. To understand why tensions between the two Asian giants are rising, some context is needed. India and China are two ancient civilizations, but as modern states, they emerged relatively recently in the middle of the last century. At first, relations between them were quite friendly. Their shared colonial past, dislike for the great Western powers, and the popularity of the idea of Asian solidarity were factors. India was the first non-communist country to recognize the legitimacy of Mao's regime and lobbied for it to be represented in the UN. However, relations quickly deteriorated and there was even a brief two-month war in 1962. The main source of tension in relations between the two Asian giants is the border issue. New Delhi claims that 38,000 square kilometers, about twice the area of New Jersey, of its territory is currently occupied by its neighbor. Beijing has similar accusations and cites a figure of 90,000 square kilometers, about the area of South Carolina, that are illegally under the control of the Indian government. It's hard to find two neighboring states where no one thinks the land border should run a little differently, or that a different flag should fly over a particular city or region except perhaps Canada and the United States, whose border is almost open. However, in our case, the situation is exacerbated by a number of objective and subjective factors. First, despite their relative geographic proximity, the states have not had active diplomatic contacts or agreements on borders in the past. This is logical given the geography. A significant part of the border runs along the Himalayan ranges. In other words, they do not have any contractual basis from which to proceed. The first demarcation agreements were signed during the British colonial administration. China considers them illegitimate, while India takes a different view of the situation. Second, the elites in both states see the neighbor as a competitor, so any concessions to them would be seen as a sign of weakness, and this would lead to a very undesirable loss of authority in the region and on the global stage. Paradoxically, it is the great similarity between India and China that fuels their competition. Usually, in such cases, compromise and cooperation emerge in the face of a third competitor. For example, France and Britain were forced to forget old grievances and form an alliance after the emergence of the powerful German Empire on the continent. In our case, however, the emergence of such a competitor is not evident. Third, the border dispute allows the elites of both states to address political and economic issues. Thus, the government in New Delhi rightly fears the emergence of new challenges after a hypothetical border agreement and demarcation. Regardless of the outcome, this would in any case lead to a reduction in the military presence there, allowing China to establish logistical routes and start flooding the border states with its cheap goods, which could seriously harm local businesses. In the case of China, the unresolved dispute allows official propaganda to justify the enormous expenditures on the army and the military-industrial complex. The argument goes, if we don't hold the border firmly, these bastards will take our ancestral territory. Even if it's about a plateau in the mountains where it's hard to breathe due to the thin air. The personalities of the leaders in both states also play a role. 
In 2013, Xi Jinping took full power in China. After dealing with opponents within the CCP, he began to pursue a tougher line in domestic and foreign policy. There was a conflict between the Philippines and China over the latter's dredging of artificial islands in the South China Sea. China began to use more aggressive rhetoric toward Taiwan, even articulating the possibility of forcibly annexing the island and de facto annexed Hong Kong in 2020. Xi's counterpart, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, came to power in 2014. He is characterized as a proponent of nationalist politics and is also accused of sliding into an authoritarian style of governance. It is no wonder that since that time, the situation on the border has rapidly deteriorated. In 2020-2021, there were the first clashes with fatalities. For eight months, the foreign ministries of the two states played ping-pong with diplomatic notes, while their border guards engaged in fights using blunt weapons. This has become a unique feature of Chinese-Indian border clashes. Both sides obviously want to measure their strength, but are afraid that it will escalate into something more. As a result, border guards do not use firearms, but actively use sticks, batons, and shields. After it became known that the Chinese border guards managed to somewhat push back their Indian colleagues, jokes appeared on the internet that their kung fu is indeed stronger. In reality, there was little comic about the situation, as the losses of each side during the confrontation amounted to about 100 people wounded and killed. Another major bone of contention between New Delhi and Beijing is the issue of Tibet. India has close economic and cultural ties with Tibet, so it was not happy when it was effectively annexed by China in 1950. Nevertheless, two years later, the Indian government recognized Chinese jurisdiction over Tibet. In this way, it wanted to allay Mao's paranoia and prevent him from destroying Tibet's autonomy. However, this approach did not work. The communist oppression continued, and in 1959, a Tibetan uprising broke out, which was brutally suppressed by the Chinese military. After this, the Dalai Lama and tens of thousands of Tibetans found refuge in India. Now his residence is located in the Indian city of Dharamshala in the north of the country. The government in exile, the Central Tibetan Administration, is also located there. This gave the CCP leadership reason to suspect India of intending to establish its protectorate over Tibet. Now it is the most militarized region of China, and it also leads in spending on police and special services. The mountainous country is very important as a symbol of gathering lands, because in the period between the overthrow of the monarchy and the establishment of the Mao regime, Tibet was de facto independent, although it did not receive diplomatic recognition. Tibet is also a powerful tourist magnet. During just the first half of last year, it attracted 24 million tourists, generating 3.6 billion in revenue. Finally, Tibet is also sometimes called the third pole because of its vast reserves of fresh water. It is home to the sources of six major rivers that flow through the territories of China, India, Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Pakistan. Therefore, Beijing's construction of huge dams here has caused great concern, as it gives it the opportunity to influence the water supply of nearly 3 billion people, which is already a serious geopolitical lever. Although the Dalai Lama has stepped down as the leader of the Tibetan government in exile, he is still considered the leader of Tibet and a symbol of its fight for independence. He is already an elderly man. This year he will celebrate his 89th birthday, and so the question of a successor is becoming increasingly relevant. Official Beijing does not hide its desire to see this title pass to a loyal person. Meanwhile, the 14th Dalai Lama himself said in an interview that with a high degree of probability, he will be reincarnated in India since he has lived here for most of his life. And if his reincarnation is indeed recognized as a person with an Indian passport, this could further exacerbate the already strained relations between the states. Another painful point in the relationship between the Great Tiger and the Red Dragon is Pakistan. Here, some context is needed. Towards the end of British colonial rule on the Indian subcontinent, it became clear that Muslims and Hindus would not be able to coexist in the new independent country. Therefore, it was decided to separate the northwestern provinces, where Muslims were the majority, into a separate state of Pakistan. Local feudal lords were given the opportunity to choose which of the newly created states to join. It seemed like a peaceful solution that was supposed to put an end to interconfessional enmity on the Indian subcontinent. However, a problem immediately arose. 
the young states could not peacefully agree on the division of territories. The conflict manifested itself most acutely in the state of Kashmir, where the elite are Hindus, while the lion's share of the population professes Islam. This resulted in three Indo-Pakistani wars and several other conflicts. It is obvious that Pakistan cannot keep up with India in terms of demographics or economic capabilities. It needed a powerful ally, and this turned out to be China. At first, they came together on the principle of, the enemy of India is my friend, but over the years they formed a strong alliance. Islamabad and Beijing cooperate in many areas, from military and technological to infrastructure development. China supports Pakistan's claims to Kashmir, and in turn, Pakistan fully supports the Chinese communists on issues related to Taiwan, Xinjiang, and Tibet. The Pakistani government was not even against China effectively annexing part of the state of Kashmir, as it saw this as an additional opportunity to annoy New Delhi. Relations between India and Pakistan remain extremely tense, and there are currently no prospects for improvement. The latter continues to provide funds, resources, and bases for various Islamist groups operating in India. And as a reciprocal favor, it helps the Balakh and Sindhi separatists. In fact, this is where the path to further escalation and a new war lies. The last escalation occurred in 2019, when nearly 50 Indian police officers were killed in Kashmir as a result of a terrorist attack. In response, the Indian Air Force struck the base of the militants responsible for the attack in the Pakistan-controlled part of the state. Fortunately, the parties relatively quickly signed a peace agreement and the prime ministers of both states agreed to jointly combat terrorism. The conflict between India and Pakistan became a global problem after both opponents became members of the nuclear club. Both have about 170 warheads at their disposal, as well as means of delivery, ground-based ballistic missiles. Therefore, any escalation between Islamabad and New Delhi instantly becomes the center of attention of the international community. A scenario is possible where they start a conflict that China would then be drawn into within the framework of fulfilling its allied obligations. In recent decades, China has been trying to increase its influence in areas traditionally considered India's sphere of influence. To do this, it uses its large-scale One Belt, One Road program. The most striking example was the situation with Sri Lanka. In 2011, Sri Lankan President Mahinda Rajapaksa became obsessed with the idea of opening a new port in the city of Hambantota. China agreed to invest in the project. But after the work was completed, the port turned out to be unprofitable, and the government of the island nation was unable to repay the loans. In exchange for a new loan, China leased the port for 99 years, and began using it not only for trade purposes. For example, recently a Chinese Navy reconnaissance ship stopped there, and according to some experts, submarines also use it. In other words, taking advantage of the vanity of the president of Sri Lanka, Xi Jinping actually obtained a valuable port right under the nose of his main regional rival. Economic competition also plays a role in fueling the confrontation. For a long time, China was clearly ahead here. Deng Xiaoping's reforms, opening up to the world and attracting investment, turned the country into a global factory of cyclopean proportions. Meanwhile, India, although it became a leader in the production of generic drugs, an influential film producer thanks to Bollywood, and a large cluster in the service sector, particularly IT outsourcing, still lagged noticeably behind. For a long time, the Indian government flirted with a socialist political agenda, plus it had the negative baggage of traditions like the caste system that seriously hampered economic development. However, the situation has now changed dramatically. Due to rising wages in China and Beijing's increasingly aggressive foreign policy, many companies have started moving to India, which has a cheap and skilled workforce. For example, Apple has started assembling its iPhone 15 here, and about two dozen luxury brands have expressed interest in manufacturing here. It is unlikely that India will become the new factory of the world. Brands are just as actively moving to other Asian countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, etc. Nevertheless, it is quite capable of taking a significant share of the industrial pie from the Chinese. So, returning to the question at the beginning of the video, how likely is direct armed confrontation between the two Asian giants? Some geopolitical experts believe that American intelligence officers are prone to paranoia and see new wars everywhere. The war in Ukraine and the Gaza Strip are not representative because there is a huge disparity in the strength of the parties involved. 
While China and India have approximately equal military might, only China's navy is stronger, since the sides will be fighting on land. However, the problem is that generals and politicians are always preparing for short, victorious wars and do not intend to wage long, large-scale conflicts involving significant forces and resources. Hitler, on September 1, 1939, simply wanted to repeat his trick of annexing Czechoslovakia, but it all resulted in World War II. Saddam Hussein intended to quickly annex the oil-rich neighboring Iranian province, but instead got a long and exhausting war. Finally, Putin also hoped for a rapid military operation to overthrow the government in Kiev, and we can all see the consequences. If China dares to embark on an adventure to annex Taiwan, India could very well strike at Kashmir in order to regain the territory seized by the Chinese. This would also open the way for it to strike at Kashgar, an important energy hub for China, through which Iranian oil passes. And this would be a very serious blow, because China is highly dependent on hydrocarbons, and according to experts, its stockpile reserves would only last for a few months. On the other hand, India has long been oriented toward the Russian defense industry. Now Moscow will not be able to make deliveries on a large scale, and in case of conflict, it won't be even able to side with China due to its total dependence on it, which has become critical since February 24. Finally, the war in Ukraine has shown that Russian weapons do not live up to their advertised formidable characteristics and often lag behind their Western counterparts. India is already preparing to redirect itself towards the US, but saturating with Western weapons will take a long time. Ultimately, unfortunately, we live in a time of a global security crisis and therefore almost anything is possible. One thing is certain. Even a limited war between two major economies and demographic giants could cause a crisis against which the Great Depression would seem like a minor mishap.